Okay, we're back, we're live, uh, and we're here uh, kind of on a, a telephonic basis uh, with uh, Will Pack. Will Pack is a research analyst for ePrink, and uh, he's uh, standing in for Lou Pugliarisi today on our Energy in America show, um, because Lou is in Shanghai. And this all relates to China. The title of our show is China's Search for Blue Skies. Well, welcome to the show, Will. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so t tell me uh, what you do at ePrink, because that's a very exciting, and I'm envious of your job. Thanks. Well, you know, it's a lot of reading. Every once in a while we write something. But uh, it's, uh, I'm a senior policy research analyst at ePrink, which, you know, is just a way of saying that I help write the papers. And uh, occasionally we uh, put on a workshop, which I'm involved in. We have some in D.C. We might be branching out to other places where we try to get some industry professionals in the room with the lawmakers and uh, the banks and those sort of folks to see if we can get some motion on some of these issues that can be kind of sticky. Uh, that's what I've been doing for the past two years and change at that point. Yeah. Sounds like fun. So you, you've great. recently collaborated with Lou on a paper involving the use of LNG uh, in China. And, and that all has to do with trying to clean up China's air, because China has uh, used coal for a long time. And I, I was telling you before the show that I, uh, I took a trip in 2008 on the Yangtze River. And uh, aside from our cruise boat, you know, most of the boats on the river were coal barges, the huge amount of coal coming down from you know, the upper reaches of the Yangtze. Um, so tell me how that has improved over the, the past few years under Xi Jinping. Well, I will say not very much, but uh, hopefully, you know, coal is down about 14% in the energy mix right now, and they're replacing it with gas with, the, uh, with what they're calling coal switching. So they're moving to, uh, right now they're at about 7.5% of the energy mix. About, that was where it was when we were wrapping up this research and um, for 2017, the most recent data we got. And they're hoping to get to 13.3% by 2020, which is looking maybe unlikely at this point. But that's how they're going to try to shift over. They're going to shift away from high emissions coal and move towards low emissions gas. Now, is there, so any, uh, say, is there any bridge, you know, uh, with... Uh, with clean coal, because we, we've had a fellow named Manny Menendez who used to uh, be the business director for Honolulu uh, County, City and County, um, and he's engaged in um, an effort to make uh, coal clean in China, and, and he's been developing processing plants for that purpose. Is there, in, in the continuum you describe, that is between coal in its, in its dirty form uh, and LNG, which is way cleaner, uh, is there any effort being uh, ad addressed to making clean coal these days? Well, there's certainly looking into clean coal. I mean, China has a lot of access to cheap coal, and coming up with a inexpensive way of making it also lower emissions would be really great. Right now, it's in the category of alternative energies, like you know, wind and solar, where it's not a big part of the mix. It's expensive to implement right now. Those uh, carbon capture facilities for clean coal could be what are obviously much more expensive than just burning coal regularly, and it's hard to compete with pipeline natural gas, which is coming in, you know, from Central Asia and uh, maybe in the future Russia. And uh, right, it doesn't. From our research, it didn't seem like it was a big, bigger standard. But I'll say we did not. But the majority of this paper, which also I should mention, I. Um, I co-wrote with an intern that we had at the time from Mongolia, whose name is Pat Odrell, and he did the majority of the research for this project. But um, we we were focused on China's uh, they, you know national policy to try to increase the amount of gas. They have a you know mandated guidelines for how they're going to uh, switch out that coal specifically with gas, so mm -hmm. they're focused on that as opposed to clean, clean coal. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's you talk about your paper, and your paper is the center of the show. The paper is, I guess it's got the same title, 
um, as the initiative itself, uh, the, the blue skies, China's search for blue skies. So uh, we have your slides. Why don't we go through them? And if you would call out yeah, the number great. of the slide, we'll show it on the screen. All right, so we can start at two, since number one is just a, uh, a title slide there. Mm -hmm. um, so to understand what's going on in China, it's kind of important to see the level of bureaucracy that's going on and, and the different hoops that we jump through. And, you know, China kind of suffered because they started with a really centralized, you know, communist system. They tried to separate it out a little bit and then centralize again and it ended up with this kind of mess. So um, at the top is the Communist Party of China, right, which yep, yep. dictates all of its goals, like, you know, environmental ambitions for social and health considerations that we just discussed, and uh, they say that to the state council. And uh, that council controls several huge agencies that all participate in national energy governance. So um, the SASC controls the big three national oil and gas companies, and uh, those are um, the China National Petroleum Corporation, Sunapec, and the China National Offshore Oil Corporation. Mm -hmm. And so those produce 96% of Chinese domestic gas production, mm -hmm. as well as about the same percentage of their LNG imports. Those, those three companies handle it. Those are nationalized. So the NDRC, which is to the right there, is the National Development Reform Commission. So it's a powerful agency in charge of national economic planning, and uh, policies related to natural gas all fall under their purview. So they issue the country's five-year plan, which um, where they lay out these guidelines for what's going to happen in the next five years in terms of energy switching and things like that. So that's important for this topic. Mm -hmm. And uh, as well, they do a lot of other big things, like you know they manage all natural gas utilization, they set prices, approve construction, and operation of LNG terminals, which is you know, very major in this topic. Mm -hmm. And um, they uh, and they control the um, NEA, the sub-agency, and it does industrial policy, which, of course, is the majority of their energy use. And um, they also handle the day-to-day -day activities of the National Energy Commission. Mm -hmm. So the NEA relies on the NRDC in policy implementation when working with the national oil companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, the National Energy Commission, which is right there, is uh, was originally created in 2010 as the highest energy consulting body, and they formulate these large national energy strategies and guidance. Um, and there's several really high-ranking government officials in, in the ranks there. So, so, uh, you know, so far we've covered. Like so far we've covered uh, three levels on your chart number two, and right. you're calling it uh, Chinese governmental bureaucracy, but it sounds from the discussion here that it's not necessarily an irrational bureaucracy. It sounds like a bureaucracy that might actually work. Am I right? Well, sort of. In reality, we have several organizations all trying to control the national energy policies. Mm -hmm. And although there's some division of labor, there, like I was saying, there's a series of these like centralizing and separating efforts kind of resulted in this chart. It's not a not a traditional organizational chart, right? It's, no, it's, there's no. a lot of crossover, and so you know, in the beginning, there's one Ministry of Fossil Fuels that was established in 1953, and then that was dismantled in the separate industries just seven years later into coal, electricity, and petroleum, and then. The State Energy Commission was created in the 1980s to uh, centralize the sector again. Mm -hmm. And then the Ministry of Energy became a single unified agency, and that was dismantled. And there's many different agencies back and forth, and this is what we ended up with here. So it's, there's a lot going on, and that it essentially makes the system for getting involved, or for predicting what's going to happen in the Chinese government very difficult for an outsider because not a lot of people kind of understand, you have to really understand the history of this and the, the breakdown of who's in charge of what. It's not, it's not like, you know, you can say that the American system looks a little strange to the outside world, but you know, we have the Department of Energy. 
Our ministry is big, covers a lot of things. And they have some agencies in there, but they all answer to the, you know, Secretary of Energy. It's a little, it's a little bit more straightforward. So that's why we lay this out in mm-hmm, right. a slide okay. Okay. and in a paper, because not a lot of papers we ran into explain this, and it made it kind of difficult to understand what was going on. Well, I suppose it's a, it's, it's a chore to try to find out who you have to talk with if you're either trying to buy or sell or, or just get information from this, this uh, schematic. Um, there's a lot of agencies that, at least to the outsider, could be overlapping. Well, it's hard on the inside, too, right? The, the, <laughs> okay. the Communist Party has a, has a tough time, you know, without a single super agency at the ministerial level. Mm-hmm. Without covering all of this, it makes it difficult. So supposedly the state council is that, but they do a lot of okay. out. Let's so go. Let's go back to that chart then. Now you have something at the bottom of it, the last, uh, the last rung, so to speak. Uh, yeah. So that's all at the local level. Okay. Right? So that that's where it finally breaks down to sort of the, the local bureaus which report up. So. Okay. Well, I mean, is, is it fair to say that this is a kind of an experimental bureaucracy? Um, and that this is all very, you know, cutting edge in a sense. Uh, they're, they haven't been considering LNG or alternative fuels uh, very much in the past few years. Now they're trying to develop a, a schematic that will be, at least in their view, more efficient? Or, or is it merely a, um, you know, bureaucracy for its own sake, as so many bu- bureaucracies yeah. are? Well, I don't think it's a bureaucracy for its own sake. I think they suffer because they are kind of a communist system with capitalists. Tendencies. So the capitalists want to make things as simplified and streamlined as possible, and you know, communists have a larger government in mind and lots of you know, sub ministries and sub agencies, and that makes it uh, difficult when they expand and contract over and over like that. Mm-hmm. You end up with something a little bit more confusing. Okay. Why don't, uh, we go to, why don't we go to slide three and see what that tells us? Yeah. So so right. So slide three. We're in the paper, we try to lay out kind of history of gas consumption. We talked about that a little bit at the beginning here. And uh, as you can see, the, we, we got our, the first LNG um, import in, into China in 2006. So until the early 2000s, gas is only less than 3% of the total energy mix in China, mm-hmm. right? So minimal. So as you can see in this chart, the average, there's an average growth rate. That's, that's not bad there. It's about 14.7%. So uh, in the leftmost chart, right, the um, production is growing, but unfortunately the consumption really takes off, right, because they start having state policies that are mandating the switch over to gas. So uh, they need to start importing, right? So on the right, right-hand chart there, um, you can see... They, uh, there's a point there in 2016 where the percentage of pipeline natural gas, percentage of LNG crossed, and suddenly they're importing more gas by um, by tanker by LNG than through pipes because they need to make up that difference that you see in the left chart somehow. They in the past, uh, China was very reliant on domestic production. They had a whole energy uh, idea that they were going to produce all their energy at, in the country and that way we wouldn't have to rely on anyone. This is something that, you know, we're pushing in America right now, right? Mm-hmm. And it makes sense from a, from a national security perspective, but unfortunately you, they, couldn't, they couldn't match the demand with their domestic production. That's why those... So if I look at the uh, red, the red the bar is the imported uh, gas? Sorry, what was that? The, the red bar. The red bars in the right side of the chart. What does that represent as against the blue bars? So the red bar is the volume of liquefied natural gas, and the blue bar is the pipeline natural gas, PNG. Okay. So the, the lines are the percentage of the total consumption. So it's volume versus uh, percentage consumption there. Okay. And, uh, and as you see, as that red bar overtakes equals 2016, the, the volume then overtakes it, they're shifting more towards LNG because there's a limitation in those pipelines, right? They, 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 can't, they can only get so much through the pipe. In fact, actually, 
some of those pipelines are actually underutilized for different mm-hmm. reasons. But you know, they're they're turning to other countries, and that's a real opportunity. For the U.S. right because we have a large resource in our country, and uh, as I'm sure my colleague who spoke here earlier has pointed out from my break, uh, our natural gas production continues to rise, and the and we have way more than we need. So, in fact, the U.S. needs to find new customers for this gas. Because if we don't, we're going to start to lose it oil production, right? And I, I think we might have discussed this, but that's because oil and gas are produced jointly, and uh, officials only allow you to flare off so much gas. So uh, the alternative is the lower production, so you can find somewhere yeah. to put the gas. So is- we're now exporting large volumes of gas to Mexico, which I think we talked about in the past, by mm-hmm. pipeline, we have so much, we also have to liquefy it, ship it, and China could be a good customer for us. How much of this gas in uh, China is from the U.S. right now? It's not, it's not a large amount. So we, um, uh, let me try and pull this number out of my head. We're, we, we're in the process of trying to ship more that direction. But remember, they, they've only been buying LNG in, in large volumes relatively recently. So we've been traditionally shipping more Japan and uh, places like that. So, and we're we're this is essentially a recent ripple. It doesn't seem recent because we're talking two two ish years here that's been happening. But the, the the LNG market is slow to react because of the prevalence of medium to long term mm-hmm. contract. Okay, why don't we go to the slide four and see what that tells us? Yeah, sure. So. Um, here we have the Chinese economic growth versus the economic consumption, sorry, versus, sorry, energy consumption. So um, this is trying to show, right, in the absence of state policy, natural gas consumption in China would have had modest growth or would have been, you know, constricted because, you know, uh, you can see that uh, on the left-hand chart, right, the economic growth is, is slightly going down, and so is the energy consumption growth. But on the right-hand chart, you can see that that is not affecting what the natural gas consumption growth percentage does. In fact, it's continuing to be positive and uh, in some cases go up. And this is, you know, because of these state policies, it's not reacting to the economy there. The state is overriding that that natural free market instinct to go at the cheapest. well, what, which is the red and which is the blue, Will? Which, what, is, what does the red signify? What does the blue signify? So on the left-hand chart, the blue line is the percentage of economic growth of the country, and oh. we're charting that against the energy consumption growth percentage. Okay. So that's across all the energy. So the energy consumption growth is still above zero, but it's not very high, and it's sort of, as you can see, tapering down there as... as sort of tracks closer along the economic growth line. But in the right-hand chart, if you look at natural gas consumption specifically, that's going up and up. And it's because of these statewide policies. And, and um, uh, and you know, and because of the policies that were wrong, obviously. You know, uh, you'd think that'd be a closer correlation. Uh, I mean, I always thought that if you have uh, abundant and cheap energy, um, you, you're going to get growth. One follows the other as night from day and love and marriage. But uh, right, well, that that works for some things, and this is you know this is in the past why uh, coal tracked economic growth, right? Mm-hmm. The economy in China grew, they, they along with their in- industrial production, right? And so because of that, industry needed energy. Coal was cheap. And so the coal amounts, you know, were, I mean, they were still com- continuing to consume coal in large volumes. So the uh, issue with natural gas is you're limited by the amount of pipes you have, right? So I have a, uh, a couple of pipelines coming in, mostly from um, Central Asia right now. And uh, the LNG market is not as liquid as the oil market and other uh, crude market, I should say, and, and, and other... Um, other markets, just because it's really difficult to 
and it's a it's a lumpy situation when you're getting into building a receiving terminal and an export terminal and setting up these you know regasification facilities and they're they're working on it and there's been some really interesting tech that's come out recently that's going to make things uh, move faster and improve the spot market and of course the Japanese are very interested in in a, a bigger spot market for natural gas but it's a uh, it's work in progress so does that mean that does that stuff. mean that as we go forward these two lines are going to be um, more consistent. Uh, in other words, when we finish the big investment in the infrastructure, the gas infrastructure, um, that those two lines will be closer, closer correlated? As the ability to import more natural gas goes, increases, the consumption growth should also increase. That's the hope. Mm -hmm. so actually, that natural gas consumption line, will, the percentage will continue to go up, mm -hmm. hopefully. And that, in, a, in a perfect world, that's what will happen, you know. Okay, let's go to number five and see what that tells us. All right, great. So this is a little bit more of what we were talking about earlier as well. So this is the uh, composition of energy consumption. This is what we call the energy mix, right? So you can see that blue line is coal. There's still a lot of blue on the right-hand side of the chart, right, where we're getting closer to today. Mm -hmm. But uh, natural gas is that that orange sliver that gets it gets bigger, but uh, there's still room for improvement. Of course, this chart we uh, took from the National Bureau of Statistics of China, and they have not um, updated it very recently. So I'm sure uh, once that comes out, you'll be able to see that that orange bar will continue to get larger, but not as fast as you'd think, you know, considering uh, there has been this large government statewide push to uh, decrease that blue bar and replace it with the orange for the natural gas. The right. issue is, you know, coal and coal and oil are still very cheap, very plentiful, and so, um, and that, and like I was saying, their energy policy has traditionally been focused on meeting that demand of domestic reserves and production, mm -hmm. relying on those imports. So, mm -hmm. um, between that and the relatively low price of and and, and, uh, okay. and, well, and uh, moving in the right direction, and I suppose you know you see a trend here from on from uh, 2009 or so, uh, where it, it is clearly uh, moving coal is moving down and, and uh, other other energy sources are moving up. But let's go to number six and, and see what that tells us. Yeah, so this is a shot that Lou had me send over. Uh, he's, that he's uh, currently at the uh, LNG 2019 in Shanghai, where this is a hotly discussed topic. Um, he wanted me to uh, just make the point that um, this is a large conference in Shanghai with a lot of uh, American representatives, as well as, you know, Gazprom is there and... Uh, from Russia and uh, um, Central Asian countries that are exporting large amounts of pipeline gas to China, and they're all discussing this issue and how they're going to replace that coal in China. So mm -hmm. we had me send it over to make that point that it's a serious uh, commitment. Well, if you look at the U.S. versus Gazprom, there's a bit of a competition there, isn't there? Um, and a cash problem would like to have a larger share of the market, and so would we. Uh, so uh, am I right to suggest that we are competing with the Russians in terms of trying to get into China? And, and that we have a kind of a rub going on with uh, Trump's tariffs that might affect uh, the result of that competition, no? Well, I, I don't think Trump is going to touch anything energy-related. I think, you know, he's smart about it what that would do to our resource. And um, China's not, not moving on anything about natural gas either. But I do agree that Russia is certainly trying to tap into this very close, close by market. And so, in fact, you know, so the, currently the pipeline natural gas in China is coming mostly from Turkmen, 80 90% of all their pipeline gas. Really? The pipeline is easier than then in liquefied natural gas, you just put it in the pipe and it goes along the pipe. You don't have to deal with the regasification and the and the compression to make it liquefied. So um, 
they get about 30 BCF annually. Um, however, the power of Siberia was supposed to come online this end of this year, December 2019, and uh, that'll go to the eastern side of both Russia and China, right? So from Russia to China, and that could really, you know, change the ratio depending on whether or not we are able to step up our export capacity. Yeah. Right? So and another project that's been discussed for a long time with little action so far, Paris Area 2, is going to come through the western borders of Russia and China. We don't have an expected time of completion of that, though. It doesn't look like anything's moving fast. So the majority of the gas coming into China is from Central Asia. There's five main pipelines running between them. and um, The other... Central Asian countries, which are now exploring to China, are Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Myanmar. So these are, you know, outpacing Russia for now. It's a competition for for sure. And I think that if that the U.S. needs to keep pushing out as much of our gas as possible, and keep in mind there's geopolitical implications of this. This is what's kind of amazing about the uh, beauty of the North American shale revolution and the ability that we have to tap into our resource and increase our technically recoverable gas reserves. You know, this, this may require uh, more nuance to the question, but the question arises in my mind as to whether uh, a pipeline, you get a better return on investment from a pipeline than you do from all this uh, transportation and processing um, in, in tankers and, um, you know, regasification at the destination. Which one is cheaper? Which one is more efficient? Which one gives you a better ROI? It's, it's cheaper once, I mean, both of them have large infrastructure costs. As we've seen in America, it's hard to get pipelines going through the, oh, even sure, our own country. Sure. But yeah. um, uh, we, we are currently exporting large, large amounts of gas to Mexico because we have the pipeline, right? Uh, it's definitely cheaper. You get more ROI if you have a pipeline and you're just pushing gas through it. And you're right. It takes an enormous amount of money as well as energy and uh, and lawyers and contracts to get um, to get gas on a tanker. But we don't have a get, we don't have a pipeline to China, to China or Russia, over that matter. And it's not looking like that's going to happen anytime soon. Mm. So. We have to focus, and, and keep in mind where our resource is. We're producing a lot of our natural gas in the Permian Basin in Texas and, you know, in the Bakken, North Dakota. So getting that gas to market means putting on a ship. Yeah. And, you know, we have our pipelines that get it to the ship, but we're forced to, and, you know, we would much, we would, we would much prefer not having to, you know, send tankers through the Panama Canal you know, which is a sort of natural choke point, that sort of thing. But we don't have that option. And Russia does have that option to China. So it's going to be a, a strong competition. Yeah. So we have to be very efficient. We have to put the money in and hope we have a long, useful life of all the equipment and processing. Okay, let's go to the last slide we can take today, Will. Um, uh, let's see what we can make of that. Oh, that's, that's a photograph of yep. Shanghai, isn't it? Yeah, that was the last one we were... We were Looking at no so that is that that's the photo that Lou sent that I was discussing earlier. Yeah. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so he wanted me to send that over. That that he's he's over there right now trying to uh, see how these deals are being made and um, emphasize that it's a it is a important concern of the Chinese government. They're hosting this. Well, I hope we can talk to you and and Lou about it again. It sounds very interesting, Absolutely. and one thing is, is clear. It's, a, it's, a, a, it's an initiative which is presently in play, and the U.S. has to keep its eye on the ball. Uh, I guess that's the ball on the, on the radio tower there in the picture, that ball. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, I think I saw you sure. on the tower. I, that, there he is, right at the top of the tower. Um, anyway, yeah. regards to him, and I hope we meet again, and I hope we can do a, an update on this, this topic again and again in the future. Thank you so much, Will. Will Pack of Eprink. And uh, aloha to you.